Hello and welcome back to the Quantum Leap Podcast. I'm Albie, and I'm so happy to have with us today the director of Salvation or Bust, Silas Howard. How are you doing, Silas? I'm good. How are you? I'm really good. I'm excited. I'm excited to get to talk to you because I really enjoyed your episode of Quantum Leap because that's what we're here to talk about mostly. But uh, in researching you a little bit for our conversation today, I discovered a whole bunch of cool things that you did. So I'd like to talk about them too. But before I get ahead of myself, uh, could you just tell us um, how you got into the entertainment business? What made you want to be a director and like your journey to get you to directing films and television? Yeah, yeah. It's um, a a bit of a backwards sort of journey. I made a feature film before I made any short film or new uh, uh, studied or, or made anything else. Um, my best friend and I co-directed, co-starred and, and, uh, co-wrote a feature called by hooker by crook that played at Sundance and South by and got theatrical and, uh, is now it's 20 year anniversary. So, um, yeah, so we just sort of leapt without looking and made this and then realized like, Oh, um, how do I practice directing? How do I, um, I didn't realize you have to be independently wealthy often to do independent <laughs> film because it doesn't mm-hmm. really pay. So um, I bought some time by going to UCLA. I got my graduate degree in film and made some crappy shorts and then made some shorts I liked and, and sort of like worked on the craft of um, directing and collaborating with actors. And, uh, and then I came out in the middle of the economy crash and made a second feature that was a similar budget, micro budget, and just directed anything I can get my hands on web series, music videos. I just kept practicing the craft and, um, and, uh, eventually I was able to land a, a directing, um, job with transparent, um, my first episode of television and worked on two seasons. And from there I got to really be involved with a lot of shows that were breaking ground with different kind of character representation. And, um, I did a third feature with a big cast, still a decently, uh, sort of small budget. And, um, and my last feature was uh, my first studio one, which is Darby and the Dead that I made with mm-hmm. Hulu and uh, 20th Century Fox. I just got finished watching that uh, Darby and the Dead. I really enjoyed that. It was, it was really good. It reminded me of like uh, 80s teen comedy, but in a good way. Uh, and also absolutely modern, like all mixed together, blended perfectly. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, um, we were really playing with the mean girls, like the elevator pitch mm-hmm. is mean girls meet six cents because mm-hmm. she sees dead people mm-hmm. and helps them. So it's not really horror, it's mm-hmm. more comedy. But um, but yeah, we wanted it to be an homage to those 80s mean girl kind of 80s and 90s films, but reflect the world around us, which is a much more inclusive world. Uh, one thing that films in that era were lacking, unfortunately. Right, right. I I thought it was cool that uh, Tony Danza was in it because I remember him from, I think, She's Out of Control, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was amazing. I mean. What's it like uh, directing like Tony Danza and and Octavia Spencer? We'll get into that later, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah, Tony was, um, you know, I grew up watching him on TV shows like Taxi and She's Mm -hmm. the Boss. And so it was like he walked out of the television set of my uh, childhood and onto the set we shot um in cape town south africa is where we shot the film so he came quite wow. a long ways to do the role and uh he was phenomenal i mean he put he just cared about every little detail and he brought a ukulele to set some days and he played <laughs> you know music for the crew and he was just so great mm-hmm. with our lead like he's play he plays a very good friend of hers in the film so he really bonded with her and he was just very gracious and generous um yeah. And he looks great. He's like, he's very Tony Danza. It's fabulous. Cape Town, South Africa. I had no idea. It looked like LA or, you know, Canada or anywhere else. Why, why did you go to South Africa to film that? It was, um, you know, uh, with these, uh, budgets, I think they have tax incentives that, uh, make it very oh. tempting to, to film in New Zealand and, uh, Cape Town. There was a producer they worked with before that shot three uh, the Kissing Booth movies there, and she uh, worked with us. She was fantastic, um, and so we had a, a local crew, and we had a lot of local casting. Our main cast was from the U.S. for the most part, but our department heads were, were from all over Manchester, um, from Taipei, and uh, and from uh, Cape Town. So it, it was an incredible opportunity. The, the just the landscape and. You know, I went and met an elephant. I don't know if you can see the elephant. Oh, I cool. Met an elephant right very there. Cool. I got a tattoo. Oh, but it wow. was very, uh, very yeah, cool. it was pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I enjoy that film. I plan to watch it with my daughter when she gets back from her mom. She's with her mom for the holidays, but I think she'll enjoy it. Uh, the end of that movie, I, I don't want to spoil it for too many people, but uh, in, in the part of the movie where uh, you see the mother and there's that music cue, I just lost it. I, it was pretty, pretty, pretty unexpected, but I got emotionally involved in the story, so. Oh, I'm so glad. I really, I really, really wanted it to be comedic in unexpected places and emotional in unexpected places. So thank you for, for sharing that. Yeah, you really nailed it. So uh, I recommend that to anybody. It's on Hulu right now, streaming on Hulu. So uh, can we talk a little bit about A Kid Named Jake? I watched that as well, and I just absolutely love that film. How do, how do you get involved oh, with that? Yeah, Jim Parsons... Um, who plays the one of the leads with Claire Danes. Um, it was his production company's first project and they brought it to me. Um, and he and Claire Danes were attached, um, but it, we weren't funded yet. So I worked with the writer, brilliant writer on the script a little bit. We went out and we got our um, the rest of our cast, Octavia Spencer, Ann Dowd, Priyanka Chopra, and um, Amy Landecker. It was just a phenomenal cast. And, uh, and we got our financing and we were able to film um, the two months that, that Jim and Claire were off from TV <laughs> to do this movie. And it was just a really beautiful exploration in like parenting and handling differences, you know, like we celebrate differences, but we also punish differences and anybody can fall prey to that out of wanting to protect, you know, we can do the wrong things for the right reason, you know, often. So, yeah. Uh, or just the setup is that they're, they're the parents of a gender, expansive expressive um uh little boy who loves princess things and they're trying to get into a new york school which is very competitive and they end up uh kind of going down the rabbit hole of like is it okay to highlight this what does it mean and and they kind of surprise themselves and then come back together through that process mm -hmm. Really beautiful film and so real that's 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 the best way i can describe it is real like so many moments in it seemed absolutely real i'm sure it has a lot to do with your direction the writing and also the actors involved uh like when the leads are having a argument that they don't want to be having and uh, that moment um that moment when the couple comes back from the hospital and uh claire dane just looks around like i've lived that moment myself and i think it was just i've never seen it represented in film before and i just thought it was amazing Oh, wow. Thank you. That kind of gave me chills. Yeah. I think that mm -hmm. moment when she walks in, I, I'm also blown away by Claire, her performance. And it just like, she, she transforms in a way. It's just, she, she's so in it. And um, yeah, it's one of my favorite fight scenes to ever direct because I think, you know, sometimes people say the worst things to get to the other side of it, you know, to forgive each other to like, but, oh yeah. I mean, thank you for sharing that. I think it's, it, we talked a lot about it and about that moment and that it's not often explored. So yeah, I really appreciate that. Yeah. It's like uh, you, you come in your house and you look around and you had all these uh, expectations and goals for the future and like slowly you're looking around and they're all disappearing. So I think yeah. that was handled beautifully. So great film. Thank you. Definitely go check Thank it out. You. I watched it on Amazon prime. I'm not sure where else it's available, but it, it's out there. So it's, it's really yeah, it worth is. a watch. Thank you. And, uh, Thank you. It's uh, it's it's awesome that you uh, made such great films, and also you're doing so much television too. How did you get involved uh, with Quantum Leap? How did how did that come about? Um, they came to uh, me actually, which was really exciting. You know, I know of the you know the original, and and uh, when I interviewed with them, I said uh, you know that concept has always appealed to me, and as a trans person, I can imagine leaping into another body. I kind of felt that way when I went from being in the world in, in a female, you know, uh, recognized way and then, and then passing and, uh, being recognized as a male. And I think that's a rare journey, you know, and I, and it, I've always said it, I felt like an unintentional gender spy, um, because of that experience. <clears throat> and, uh, mm -hmm. but it also has created a lot of empathy in me and, and understanding sort of paradoxes and how we're all, we're all trying to be the right kind of man or woman or father or parent or you know girlfriend it's just like we're you know we're all sort of struggling and and trying to find our way and uh so i i feel like the way and also that the show i'm really obsessed with hidden histories or you know un, unrecovered histories because uh there's a lot of things that happen that just don't make it into the you know into the books or even in our storytelling mm -hmm. 
And so Quantum Leap had that appeal to me as well as just going back and saying like, hey, actually, all of us have been around forever. It's just that either the language wasn't there or um, it wasn't uh, permissible, you know, to be to be uh, in front of the screen, in front of the camera or part of the history books. Hmm. Was uh, the trans character in the episode Salvation or Bust, was that in there before they brought you on or was that something you added or? No, actually, yeah, they, that was in the episode. And um, I was really excited because it was a really amazing, the writers are incredible on it. And um, we cast um, uh, Marquise Wilson, who I've worked with on A League of Their Own and who's a phenomenal actor. And um, I was really excited reading that this character was trans and, and that the writing didn't really talk about it at all. And mm. it was kind of a fun moment to be like, oh, because Marquis, he will definitely be read as male. I don't think anyone would know he was trans. Then we talked about, do we want to tip the scale just a little bit more to hint at, at it? And that's like such a wonderful luxury because, you know, the fast moving pace of of trans representation has been phenomenal. But then there's a lot of complicated things of like, we need you to look trans or we need you to not look trans. And like, it can be kind of, you know, this was done so beautifully where we got to just talk about the nuance and play with, with what it feels like, you know, and, and also, you know, there's the intersection of race and um, gender, you know, in this story. And yeah, it was just fun to do that all through a genre, you know, and through, you know, through the old West and what the old West means to so many people. Yeah, when we watched the episode, we had no idea he was a trans person and uh, uh, the character either until we got to interview Marquise. So uh, then we found out. So it, it brought on up so much meaning because we knew there was something there and it was uh, important, but we weren't sure what. So I think that was great. So Yeah, it was really very, very subtle. We just added a little bit about like him talking the way he was born. But um, same with Darby, you know, there's a character who's trans and we just mentioned it one time in the locker room and, uh, and kind of just let it. Oh yeah. Let it move I, oh, I from- laughed. <laughs> I <laughs> laughed at that part. She's like still trans. Really yeah. <laughs> was and the he friends like, trans oh, yeah. as well? Yeah, absolutely. I didn't have a chance yeah, to look. Nicole, oh, that's great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. That's why we, we talked about it. Cause I, you know, I, I, I was aware I told, I said to her, yeah, your character is queer, but let's decide if you're out as trans or not. And so mm-hmm. we decided together mm-hmm. that that would be the moment, did some improv. And I felt like it was just perfect because she still got to be a teenager and a mean girl and, you know, all these other things. But uh, we let that just live in the room for, for a minute, especially the girls locker room, you know, in particular. So yeah, it was really fun. And same with this. It's, um, yeah, it's such a story to have stories where the people are people first and then we you know unfold things about their experience mm-hmm. as the story moves on as it should be i think you know yeah so that that was just handled yeah. well <laughs> that was that was good um Thanks. so what's it like directing a western were you ever into westerns uh, was that a new thing for you i mean it was really my the cinematographer is phenomenal and she unfortunately had COVID our third day in because we planned Mm -hmm. all these epic and there were amazing cinematographers that came in. It was just, we had this very Western, you know, playing with shadows, playing with long shadows, playing with a lot of sky and certain angles Um, because it's TV, not all of those fancy shots got to live in, you know, we had a nice sort of top down when the horses, you know, when the bad guy comes in and there's just the shadows across the, the dusty terrain, but we, we were filming in 105 degree heat wave. It was, it was an intense, it was an intense week to be on the back lot, but also we were on the back lot. It gets the most famous Western set and it's been in every Western movie, you know, Hollywood Western. And so it was, I felt like we were really, you know, getting to bring our own sort of brand of Western to it um, and onto a really iconic set. Yeah. Was that Anna that was the director of photography of that episode? Yeah. Yeah, she's amazing. She's really, she's such an artist. And uh, I think she comes from choreography or dance, but I can feel it mm-hmm. in her lighting and in her um, her handling of, of what the frame, what's in the frame and, you know, how much story can we get into every frame. So it's really fun. Yeah. Hmm. What's the, what, what's the collaboration like with you and say, Anna, for that episode? Uh, like who picks the angles, who picks the... The lighting, like, uh, is it a team effort or how does that work? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a, especially on that show, they have um, two cinematographers. So the director actually gets to prep the whole time, which is rare on TV. Usually you grab a lunch with the cinematographer and they're exhausted and you just try to like get a few, um, you know, ideas in front of them. So we got to, we got to bond and, and play and pull references for each other and talk about like strategies for, sh- for what we were filming. We had a high page count and, you know, a really short amount of time. So that was the other challenge. Like, you know, where do we spend the money and where do we, um, you know, where do we keep it, keep it moving and keep it sparse. So it was, yeah, it was a really great collaboration and the writers too were with us, you know, mm-hmm. for any questions and certainly all through the production. Um, I feel like the little town got to the actors really bonded together um, as people outside of their characters too. So that's always fun. Yeah. yeah so, so little time and so such in a rush. Yeah. Normally. Yeah. Yeah. We exactly. got, we got to speak to many of the actors uh, from this episode and all of them said it was a very fun set and they had an amazing time and they all were very complimentative of you. Thank you. That's so nice to hear. I feel like, um, you know, what we do is mostly process, you know, you spend 80% of your time making the thing and then it's, it goes by, you know, like in a bip. And so I've made a promise to myself, if I wasn't going to enjoy the process that I should do another job. So I just feel like everything on set is part of what goes into the show and it, it should be as, you know, the goals should be close together, you know, and, uh, I really love, I love overthinking everything. I love like character backstory and I love collaborating with actors and just there's no small moments. Like everything should feel like, you know, it's got a purpose and the characters are invested and for comedy, I think the stakes should be even higher. So it's, it was really fun and they were generous actors. So it was, it was easy to do for sure. How is it different um, directing television from directing a feature? Oh, the the um, <clears throat> collaboration is uh, much more uh, weighted towards the writer and the showrunner. So in a feature, the director is pretty much on the hook for making um, main decisions. They do it in collaboration with the studio as well and producers. But in TV, the writer and show creator um, hold the big picture. And I, I come in and I'm like a very fancy, fancy um, nanny for the episodes that they have. <laughs> and I, you know, like my job is to make sure I'm thinking of things that maybe they didn't have time to think of and try to bring my own lens to certain things, but let it be part of the show, make sure that it's not, you know, that I'm in service to the project. And I I think it's great because it teaches me to practice, you know, I get to explore other genres. I get to live in other worlds that I wouldn't necessarily build myself. And then I get to bring that practice to my films, you know, by, by stretching in different directions creatively. Um, yeah. And it's just fast. You can't, you gotta, you gotta keep your pace up. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Uh, would you do another quantum leap if they offered it to you? Yeah. Oh, totally. It was a really wonderful team. I mean, from the top down, really, um, Martin and, uh, you know, just Ben and and Derek, the writers, it was just a great, and Anna, such a great team. Um, and I love that they had a philosophy of, you know, to not do any harm. Like even the horses, they didn't want to do this certain stunt that is like a really stressful thing for horses to do, especially in a heat wave. And I just love that. I thought that was just such a great um, philosophy to do, especially in an industry that's not been known for being super kind to people or animals (laughs) for the most part. Yeah, definitely. Kindness to the people involved. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. What was was that like, uh, the long hours with that cast and Ray and Caitlin? Oh, Kate, Frank, Caitlin, I mean, the whole team, I was sad I didn't get to work with um, all the rest of the headquarter team as, as much as, uh, but, it, but they were f- so delightful and they were bonding with each other. You know, it was like episode five, everybody's kind of gelling. Um, and Ray and Caitlin, their chemistry is amazing and really, really fun. Just they had a great sense of humor. And even though it was just hot as hell and long hours, they were, yeah, they were, they're pretty badass. They were just really a delight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, when we spoke to Eddie Park, I think his name is, um, it, he was telling us so many fun stories. Do you have any fun stories from the set? God, we have, uh, well, I, I guess this isn't necessarily a fun story, but we were really running behind and it was downpour raining and we were supposed to film outside. And so we just did this, we just designed this kind of shot that Caitlin because her character is not seen. And so she was like, instead mm-hmm. of standing next to Ray, why don't I move? And I was like, oh yeah, you can be 
anywhere, then she can be talking about the characters behind them, looking and pointing and saying to him, like, this person can build an explosive, this person can do that. And then they are looking at each other and that longing for each other plays and just the more dynamic frame. And we kind of filmed it almost in a wonder with the rain in the background was really just like a fun discovery that we did as a group. It was really like we added a little improv. And I think those are rare finds in TV where you have a little room to to play around. And uh, so, yeah, that was a fun collaboration. And uh, to have Caitlin's character be able to have a different way of interacting with Ray was, yeah, was fun. Uh, what was it like to be the director to get to, uh, I guess, direct the scene where a lot of us fans find out a big, important story beat of the arc of the season with this Leaper X? And and how did you direct that scene without giving us too much information? Because we don't want to know before we, we find out other things. But what was it no, like on the no. day? I mean, honestly, Martin, that's really a hand I have to tip my hat to him because he's holding the bigger picture and the writers and Derek and Ben, um, Benjamin, um, because they are holding the the piece. I think I had a number of ways I had a, I had a, a contra zoom planned, which ultimately didn't serve the scene. So that's, you know, I talked about it ahead of time and it's, you know, I, I always encourage trying things out that might not work if, if we're have all the other things. And so, um, so that was one that I tried out and it ended up really just being this, um, way of, of capturing the surprise, breaking the moment between them. But, you know, really the blocking and everything, I think that ended up being one that was super collaborative. And and I would just hats off to, to Martin because uh, he's holding the big picture and knows exactly what that moment needs. And that was, yeah, that's a big, big moment. And, uh, and so, yeah, for the actors and I, we were still floundering without knowing what those future moments were. Mm-hmm. So it was interesting. It was mm-hmm. like a mystery for us as well. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Um, I know we talked about um, Quantum Leap and we talked about A Kid Named Jake and we talked about Darby and the Dead. Is there any other work that you would really want fans of yours to check out in addition to those, of um, course? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there's a bunch of things that I that I love that I've made. And um, I mean, I think the biggest uh, amount of work that I've done on on shows lately is Dickinson, which is an Apple TV show up about Emily Dickinson, but it's got a very contemporary oh, wow. twist. I worked on all three seasons and the last season set in the civil war. And it's, it's a half hour period comedy, but it deals with really heavy, you know, subjects and beautiful poetry. And, uh, I don't know, it's a very unique show, um, that I was really involved in and, uh, it's, it's worth a check out. Yeah, for sure. It's a very odd tone though. I'll check that out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Cool. I'll check that out. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much uh, for being with us today. I really learned a lot and I appreciated talking to you. And um, I think we have a commentary to record. How's that sound? Perfect. Thank you. It was really a pleasure. I, I loved the feedback right. that you had. Thank you. <laughs>